Cheers, guys. Epix 911, welcome to the Sunday, July 9th, 2017 edition of VR News. Lots to talk about tonight, guys. Let's jump right into the news. Start with the first story, which I'm actually going to do as an editorial based on a question that Upload VR asked its readers simply, do you still use your Samsung Gear VR? Now, I'm going to rephrase that slightly to, do you still own a Samsung Gear VR? And if you do, do you still use it? Yes, no, why not? And throw it back at you guys. I would love to know in the comments below if you have it still, if you got rid of it, do you use it? If so, for what? And if you don't, why? Uh, but now me. <laughs> so first part of that, yes, I still have it. In fact, this is my second. I got the white one. And then about a couple of days later, they announced this. So I replaced it with this. Second part of the question, do I still use it? No, and I haven't for about two months. And it's for the obvious reason that I no longer have a compatible phone. I handed in my Samsung S7 when I left my previous employer. And I'd gone through a couple of the Note 7s and we know the issues that that phone had and Samsung in general, which is kind of leading into the point of the editorial, which is, and I've said this from the beginning, right? There will be casualties. The only variables who and when in terms of VR. Here we are a year later, we can look back and all the benefits of 2020, analyze the companies and see who's in the worst position. And while I have always maintained and still do, Samsung is in the unenviable position of basically being the hardware monopoly supplier for most VR solutions. They painted themselves into a bit of a corner with the Gear VR. Now, they say 5 million sold, but let's be realistic, it's 5 million sold and or promote. And it's pretty unique to their situation that they were the hardware component of the arrangement. Contrast, Daydream from Google, not in that same position. And as a result, they've even opened themselves up to more Android possibilities. I think it's just a matter of time and hopefully they see the writing on the wall and even if it comes at the expense of, you know, maybe a lot of the benefits of their arrangement with Oculus for viability of the platform, it gets opened up to other Android phones. I, I see that as the only long-term solution for them. The other day, I talked about the evolution of non-cockpit VR, the troubles with it, and kind of the evolution. Well, a perfect example of that evolution is Lone Echo. Let's take a look at Lone Echo and let's discuss some of those uh, little steps that that game is taking moving forward. I'm just going to summarize it. The detailed hands and arms. I mean, look at that, right? Every surface or object in the game can be touched. You can pick stuff up, grab stuff, and Road to VR calls it smart procedural posing system. And that has to do with the grip and general animation. It always seems to be tailored to what you are actually doing, right? Touch a smooth surface, that's represented. Pinch grip something, that's represented. A lot of developers shy away from that because there's no real arm tracking and it can break immersion, right? If you have your hand in one position but the arm in another and your in-game avatar is somewhere else entirely, even though the hands are in the same place, it can look odd and it can break immersion. Lone Echo just through some really brilliant programming totally, completely gets around that, which is amazing. Now, I can't wait to try it for myself see if I can break it. That's just the tester in me. But so far, I'm a believer just based on what I've been hearing and what I've been seeing, but nothing is going to beat hands-on. Vive and Touch controller games can still be way more fun. They just aren't where they need to be yet at that same level where Hotas and Racing Wheel is, right? But they've had decades to get to where they are and so much else of what they do is simplified compared to non-cockpit VR games. So completely understand that. Uh, I'm just happy to see 
continual, small, incremental steps moving us in that direction, which is freaking awesome. All right. And our next story, it uh, concerns a French company, Theoriz, and they're basically holodeck style technology. We looked at these guys back in October. Let's look at their latest video together and just see how much this has improved. It's pretty cool. Now, if we look in the video, you're going to see the first little bit, pixel cubes. Those are configured to provide illusion of depth, right? And you'll notice the guy jumps on them, it pounds them further down, and the entire graphic on the floor reflects that. And that looks to be kind of the strength and weakness of this system as I see it. So as a strength, I think that works really well. The technology having, you know, uh, the floor either give way or build as you walk. Like from a puzzle point of view, you walking, having parts fall away, the system can handle that really well. In contrast to that, what it can't handle well are some of those less kind of nuanced movements and steps. Like for example, the escalator. If you look at the escalator, it's the guy rolling like a four-year-old down the escalator and then off to the side. The game has no freaking clue what the hell he's doing. He's literally just decided to drop, tuck, and roll. The game just continually, you know, continues on its merry way producing the escalator graphic. So while I get what he did for the purpose of filming it, as far as the game's concerned, He's still standing there and not rolling around like an idiot. And that, I think, is the weakness of this. Anywhere the guy's doing simple movements, like pushing against the wall and the wall gives way, the system can handle that perfectly. Buttons, no problem. Toggles, switches, all of that, I think, work. It's the more complex reaction to the world around him that this technology just doesn't seem to be well suited for go back to that escalator thing if that was in you know your typical rift uh vive or playstation vr game the game world would have reacted to you stepping sideways even if you were doing it to clown around, the game world could have adjusted to that simply because it's monitoring your tracking that accurately, right? So it's interesting. It looks great. It's probably going to be even more amazing in the future, but the stage where it's at right now, I think just give me my VR. I'll pass on that, but I will check it out from time to time. So yeah, what do you guys think about the holodeck room. And our last story, guys, Mel Science company we last talked about October 2016. They're a company doing all kinds of exciting things uh, in the home and classroom with regards to science using virtual reality. Let's take a look at their latest video and see what's changed, what's updated since we last took a look at these guys. Now you can see here in the video, and I love this, I love how kind of the home start area feels familiar, right? You've got the periodic table of elements, just like every science classroom you've probably ever been in. So you immediately feel at home just having that periodic table of the elements front and center, which is great. You'll notice that the video itself states that it covers kindergarten to grade 12 US curriculum chemistry science. So that's perfect. That's a huge range of topics and things to cover. And, you know, not necessarily for or against homeschooling, but having something like this would be pretty damn cool, whether you're in the classroom or at home. I love the little bit about just assembling atoms, allowing the students to assemble their own atoms. When I was in school, it was all the dry stuff, you know, your neutrons and this and that and electrons and how everything was put together here. You're actually able to do that in VR, that hands-on, because everybody learns different. Some kids prefer hands-on. Back in October, I talked about it and 
a little upset at the time because I felt they'd really dumbed down science. Not male science, just the industry in general with, you know, continually neutering these chemistry kits. But I get it. From a safety point of view, there's, look at the internet. There's all kinds of recipes, dangerous chemical recipes, freely, easily available. And, you know, you got the wrong kid with a chemistry set, or it doesn't even have to be a kid. It could be an adult and literally could be, excuse the pun, a recipe for disaster. So I get all of that. The sad part of that, though, is a lot of those kits were responsible, like Star Trek was, for creating engineers, you know, for creating future scientists, those working in chemistry or physics. So what I love is seeing something like Mel Science come along and restoking those fires of enthusiasm for kids where they can do this stuff, get excited all over again, and carry that into adulthood, and hopefully, if it's something they're passionate about, into a profession. Well, guys, that is it for the news on this Sunday. Tomorrow is my last day here before the travel start. Those should be fun, but I'll fill you in on, on that uh, when we get there. In the meantime, guys, if you like this video, please consider clicking on like. It really helps the rankings of this video. Guys, as always, cheers.